Hello, everyone, and welcome to this FMB webinar on the 30th of March 2021. Um, it's worth just reflecting that it's a year now since we've been doing these FMB webinars. This is my 25th webinar. Uh, we started on the 17th of April last year when lockdown first started. Um, so I don't know if there's anybody who's joined us today um, who attended that very first one, but thank you for sticking with us, if so. Um, so thank you for joining us this afternoon. And this webinar today is all around the theme of managing people, building up a really good team around you to help you in your business. And we all know that building up a really good team of motivated, reliable, skilled people is a big challenge. Sometimes you have to restructure your business and let people go. Sometimes you might be looking forward to build up your business and realize that you haven't got the right people with the right skills in place. So all of these are big challenges, and hopefully um, you'll pick up some useful information from today's speakers, which will help you with some of that. Um, we've got Anoop Sodi from Quest, who are um, an organization that provides advice services to FMB members. So Anoop is very uh, accustomed to dealing with members' queries and questions on all sorts of HR-related issues. Then we've got Bryony Wickenden. Bryony works at Seeker and is very much a driving force behind the drive towards increasing fairness, inclusion and respect in the construction sector. So Brian is going to give us some information about that. And then we've got my colleague Phil Hodge from our southwest region, who um, is going to talk to us about the Kickstart program and how you can access um, support through that scheme. So first of all, some housekeeping. If you have a question for any of our speakers, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Just pop your question in there and we will um, share those at, towards the end of the presentation. Um, I am also going to launch a poll so that we can get some information from you about the kind of teams that you're managing. Um, so I'm going to launch that now before we start, because it'll be helpful to all of our speakers to know about the size of company that, um, that you're running. So if you wouldn't mind clicking in the box that's appropriate to you about how many workers that you employ. So that's not subcontractors, but full time employed workers or, or part time workers. So that's showing that by far the majority of you are employing between one and five people and some are employing quite a few more. I'll share the results to that on the screen now. And that's not surprising because the typical size of an FMB member company would be in that one to five category. So I'm um, not surprised to see that at all, but it does help us to understand uh, the audience that we're talking to. So I'll stop sharing that result now. And without further ado, I shall hand over to our first speaker who is going to talk about um, redundancy issues and how to deal with that challenge. And that's Anoop from Quest. Over to you, Anoop. Thank you, Hayley. So I um, hope you can see me quite clearly there. I'll just go through the presentation and my colleague Tony will upload the document so that we can all go along and read through the presentation. OK, so just as a, as a brief insight for your own information, I'm on the helpline at Quest Cover. I provide um, HR advice on redundancies and all sorts of issues. So if there is any topical subjects that you do want to talk into more detail about, do give us a call on the uh, helpline number and we're happy to sort of proceed through that just for inf information in case you were not aware of that. So we'll move on to the next slide. Now, on the helpline, before we actually launch into the discussion of what is redundancy and, and how to deal with redundancy, we always try to look and explore options before we get to that stage, because quite often a lot of clients out there don't know what options they have. So we always go through a number of options before we say, actually, maybe this is a redundancy situation. So the first thing I would advise is, um, do you have a layoff or short time working clause within your contract of employment? Very important that you do have that in there, if not to consult with your staff. 
Now, what layoff and short-term working means is if there is a lack of work and there is hope that in some point uh, work will increase and pick up, you could potentially lay off your staff for a period of time or implement a short-time working element, for example, if they're working Monday to Friday, perhaps short-time working being come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So you're reducing it for a temporary period of time until work picks up as as an option. Moving on from that would be to reduce working hours permanently if you've already forecasted, which a lot of our clients already have in terms of the pandemic. And if there is simply no work coming in, we would want to have a discussion to permanently reduce the hours, which may change in future when things do pick up. Again, another option to be considered. Now, uh, On the back end of Rishi's extension on the furlough scheme that has now further been extended up until the end of September could be an option. A lot of employers have already started meaningful consultation, but as soon as this came onto the radar, they dropped that and put staff on furlough in order to avoid redundancy. That's another thing that's that's occurred. Businesses have explored recruitment options and quite regularly some industries do have agency staff that's been put on a permanent freeze because simply no work in terms of that. So it's about ways of saving money, which also overlaps on overtime. You know, if you can reduce that over time through consultation with your staff in order to see what you can do to avoid redundancies, massive redundancies within your business. And lastly, it's a convent. Um, in this pandemic, though there are other businesses that are thriving out there, it might be a, a solution to keep your staff on the books, but on a secondment level and to loan your staff out to other thriving businesses. So that's that's also something to consider. So we always go through what can we do before we get to redundancy. But if none of these options are a uh, none of these are options for you, then you're simply moving into the redundancy field. Okay, so it's important that we define what redundancy is. Um, Nine times out of 10, people will assume they know what it means. You know, can I just make this one person redundant because I don't like him? No, that's not how it works. We always go through the definition of what is redundancy. The term redundancy means the job no longer exists. It's not there in your structure and you must have a business case to demonstrate the reason why it's not in this in structure. Um, It's a difficult topic. Again, do talk to us in more details if you are undergoing this exercise. Typically, when you're going through a restructure and we're talking about the business side of it, the case, the reason why um, business has dropped, i.e. the pandemic, lack of clients, lack of customers, lack of delivery, there is a strong business reason there to sort of think about redundancy as a potential. Now, a lot of your businesses are sort of aimed at small to medium-sized businesses. So if you do have less than 20 Uh, members of staff, you are okay to go through a two-week meaningful consultation. More than 20 employees is up to between uh, up to 99 days, and that's the 30 to 99 days, which is the 30-day consultation period. Um, Over 100 do speak to us in, in more detail about that because that will involve going through electing employee representations if you are looking at a bigger scale. But if you're on a smaller front, it would be two weeks. So in the procedure that I started with, number one is to have your business case ready. It must be demonstrated. Um, provide that case to staff that are going to be affected so they can understand the reason why they're at risk. And then obviously the time frames. let's just go, for example, less than 20 employees that you're looking to be making redundant. You would need to fulfill a two week meaningful consultation, meaningful, meaning that you have to explore other options before you get to the point of being made redundant. So the business case, as I mentioned, strong business case. Questions will come up during that meaningful consultation, which is why it is fundamental that we do get it right at the initial stage. Why are their jobs at risk? What does the new structure look like? How has the current climate affected their role, i.e. lack of uh, work coming in due to the COVID pandemic? 
And potentially you may get long serving employees who may be the first to put their hands up to say, I'm happy to go through a VR situation, which is voluntary redundancy. And if they wish to do so, then that would be of their own accord or ultimately we will need to go through a procedure. It's important that whilst you're going through this whole procedure that you do demonstrate a paper trail to show that you've gone through a fair and uh, and reasonable procedure. One of the things tribunals tend to look at, and, and this is what I always sort of imagine the worst is, what does your employee personnel file look like to demonstrate that you've gone through a fair and reasonable procedure with your staff to show that you have given consideration and you've been fair by all means. And that is definitely available to you as FMB clients on the website from start to finish on in terms of redundancy. So we're able to follow that procedure through. So uh, within that meaningful consultation, we will look at those options, as I described earlier on, layoff, um, as well as um, short time working. You're also looking at limiting overtime. So have a look at all these options first, even if that means discussing with that with client, with your staff during that consultation. So they understand that you are as a business looking at the overall bigger picture and what we can do to avoid it. In fact, definitely do encourage them to go away, think about ideas, what can we do to to make it work for you? Other staff may say, I'm happy to go part-time. Again, it's entering into that meaningfulness, which is quite significant in this case. So typically on the helpline, we may get a scenario which would be important for you guys to understand is what if we need to reduce five members of staff to three? How do we go through a fair procedure? Now, you need to make sure that you have your business case ready and you do consult with all five that unfortunately you all five as warehouse operatives have permanent roles here. However, after forecasting, uh, we really only need three. So what we will be doing is first offering VR. Who would like to go voluntary? You can, by all means, go away and think about this option. If you wish to do so, come back to me and we'll look through the option. Now, that doesn't mean all five put their hands up for VR. It is determined by the company. The company can determine who can go. So the employer has the upper hand here. If you have no VR options, then it's potentially going through a matrix which you need to explain to your staff. So you've got five staff members there. We'll be going through a matrix selection based on your skills, your qualifications, your experience, any ongoing disciplinary or lateness matters. So it's important that we do everything fairly on an objective front. So we're not using our own subjective opinions. Simply, I just don't like you. It has to be objective to show that you're going through a process. Now, the one that scores the lowest are the most likely people to be brought in for that meaningful consultation to explore other routes but they would be the first potentially two to leave the business. Now, there have been cases where it has been quite tight on numbers, and that's where the selection may come in in terms of re-interviewing your staff based on a new job description, showing the job that they do. So it's a matter of saying, here's the job description, all five, go away, have a look and prepare yourself for it, and we will score accordingly on an objective manner. So... The procedure is sound. It is a fair procedure. There is no subjective element to it. It's simply that we cannot afford to have five members of staff, but three, but we've gone through a procedure. So that's very important. At the end of the stay, end of the procedure, unfortunately, there will be a situation you're going to have to let somebody go. Now, based on that example of the five reducing to three and two people are now left to be made redundant and you've gone through a fair redundancy procedure and consultation, the last stage is to invite the individuals for a formal redundant meeting. Now that means that they have the right of accompaniment, ideally somebody else within the business, or if there are members of a TU business, that are members of TU rep, then they can have a rep in with them. 
and the employer must first invite formally in writing. Uh, you have the right of accompaniment, uh, and at that scheduled meeting, you would discuss that you've gone through a fair procedure, we've done everything possible to mitigate that circumstances of redundancy, and as a result of that, you have been at, put at risk. Now, if the individual has over two years service, the, in, the employee will be eligible for redundancy pay. Now, just for your own information, on the gov.uk does give a guideline that up to 22 years of age is half a week pay. 22 to 40 years old would be a week pay and 41 and over is a week and a half pay. And then it goes on in terms of number of years of service. If an employee has been there longer than 20 years, 20 years is the cap and further information to support you on the calculation is on the gov.uk website under redundancy calculator. Do have a look at that. The rate at the moment is capped at uh, £538, but that's soon to change April the 6th to £544 per week if that if that's the amount that you're calculating on so it's capped at that stage for those staff who are on a higher level of pay um, the the notice period will also be applicable so statutorily for your own information is one week for every year of service up to a maximum of 12 weeks and of course any holiday pay owing to the individual Contracts is key here. So you're looking at the contract of employment. It's important to check, does the individual work their notice? Would you like them to be paid in lieu of notice simply because there is no work? Or can the individual be put on garden leave, meaning that they need to be available for work as and when required during the 12-week period or eight-week, however long notice period they have? And, uh, and the employer is able to do that. But again, definitely enclose that in the letter, whatever you're wanting to do. Um, finally, the employee has the right of appeal. Now, the right of appeal means that the individual could appeal the, the decision by stating that the situation is all one-sided, um, uh, the process is flawed, you've had it in for me from the start, and therefore I want to appeal the procedure which is their right and objective to do so. But as I mentioned earlier on, if you have a fair paper trail to show that you've done everything fairly, accordingly, everything's been documented on an objective trail, then it's more likely to side it with the employer rather than the lack of paperwork and using your own subjective opinions in terms of that. Here are examples of a couple of case studies, which you're more than welcome to have a look on online, and they are quite um, open out there in terms of this. But these cases are very important because it quite clearly does show that employers who have failed to follow a redundancy procedure, lack of paperwork, lack of meaningfulness, and a lack of um, structure to their redundancy procedure has resulted in the employee winning. So um, Capita, Hart, Shed, Pinewood, Cassidy, and Lizell, um, the employees won their case through tribunals with a substantial hefty thousands of pounds worth of compensation. Not only was it bad damage reputable in terms of the business, but the employer had to pay out a substantial amount. Just the Liz Elk and Larkin case alone, the individual was awarded £17,000 compensation because the employer failed to follow a fair procedure. So it's very important that we do get it right at the initial stage, including the paperwork. So please do be mindful of that. We come to the end of the 20 minute, 20 minute uh, presentation. So what we will do is allow anyone to, or everyone to pass through any questions. And I'm happy to answer those questions during the duration of this uh, seminar. And if there's anything else that you want to talk in privately in terms of any problems that you're having with your business, do give us a call. So what I'll do is I'll hand you over back to Hayley and thank you for your assistance today.
Okay. Thank you very much for that, Anoop. And just to reiterate, any FMB members in the audience, if you call the HR advice line, the number is on the website and we'll put it in the follow-up email as well. Then you'll get through to Anoop or one of her colleagues to answer questions on this or any other aspect of, of HR as well. And the document library is also available via the members area of the website. And I think that includes template contracts of employment. Correct. Everything is on there. If you, you know, you've got access to it, do use it because it's only going to help you in the long term. Yeah, great. Thanks, Anoop. So I think without further ado now, we're going to hand over to Bryony Wickenden. And um, yeah, as Anoop said, if you have any questions, do begin typing them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, um, and then we'll come back to those at the end. But I'll now hand over to Bryony to talk a bit about fairness, inclusion and respect. And we didn't give Bryony very long at all. So she's got a whistle-stop tour through her remarks. Thank you, Bryony. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me, Hayley. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about the a program that's very close to my heart, which is called the Fairness, Inclusion and Respect Program, or otherwise known as the FUR. Now, I normally take very much longer than the five minutes I'm allowed. So I've taken the liberty of asking uh, FMB if they will show a very short two minute video which explains what it's all about and then I'll give a little bit of extra background on that so if we can just let the video roll that would be great welcome to our workplace everyone here is different we each have our own DNA backgrounds education experiences lifestyles and interests that diversity means we each bring unique valuable ideas to work Whatever our similarities or differences, we want every person here to be respected and treated fairly, so that we all feel included, safe and supported to do the very best job we can. The professional language and behaviours we prefer here might be different to those in other workplaces. Everyone is entitled to their views, but opinions should not be expressed if they might cause offence or result in anyone feeling excluded. For example, Let's avoid jokes or banter that might be hurtful to anyone. Bullying, harassment, victimisation and discrimination are not acceptable here. If you become aware of such behaviours against yourself or others, you can challenge them. But you might prefer to report them to a manager, supervisor or through a system that will either be explained at the end of this film or in your induction pack. Remember, the standards we walk by are the standards we accept. Because everyone is different, we all have different needs. We try to make reasonable adjustments so that every person is able to continue working safely and securely, even when they have a health consideration or a visible or invisible disability. If you identify with this, please speak to a manager or supervisor. Let's all help to promote fairness, inclusion and respect and make our workplaces even better for everyone. Right. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, that's really what the FUR programme is all about. Now, I'm conscious that I'm following um, Anoop, who's been talking about making people redundant, and I'm talking about attracting and retaining people. So it's a little bit the, the other way around. Um, I'm also conscious that that video showed more than five people in most of those organisations. However, I think all of us within the industry want to be treated with, with fairness and with respect. Um, I always liken it to wanting um, organisations to treat people the way they would want their own family or relations or friends to be treated. And that's really, really important. Now, we do have a skills shortage within the industry. Um, it's not insignificant. We do need to attract more people into the industry. Um, and it is more difficult when we put barriers up. And the whole thing about the FUR programme is trying to remove those barriers. Now, 
obviously that video was was produced f- as as an induction for larger organizations than the majority of you um represent however um i think it is relevant um and i also think that smes are far far better at being inclusive and respectful than the larger organizations who rely on policies and procedures smaller organizations very definitely do get inclusivity in a lot of cases you have to um because you're competing with with others for for um for your jobs lots of people think actually if i work for a big organization i'd be better off that's not always the case small organizations can offer flexible working far easier than a large organization who has to consider every other member of staff um so i think there's a lot that that the large organizations can learn from the small organizations so i'm not here to lecture you on how to be inclusive that's certainly not my my intention my intention is really to let you know that there is a, a program called the fairness inclusion and respect program it's free to everybody there's a lot of resources tremendous number of resources and i know that after this session today um some um details about courses that are being held will be circulated um i think you may also have already received some flyers about the program um the program is developed by industry and we do have some smes within the steering group to help us um it's for the industry we cover things like um like recruitment but we also cover language the language that's used um and let's face it at the moment that's very much a topical issue um you can't switch on the television or open a newspaper at the moment without seeing some controversy about how people are being treated and the fairness inclusion and respect program is all about treating people with dignity with fairness and with respect um so i'd like to invite you all to have a look at the the information that fmb are going to be sending you i'd really like you to engage with the with the program um as i say it is free a lot of it is e learning tools there are some webinars if you can't attend the webinars the webinars can be accessed via the website um after the event so that you can see what it's all about so if one particular topic takes your fancy have a look at it and join us that's about it i think that's my 5 minutes Brilliant. Thank you Brianne for condensing all of that into sh- such a short space of time. I think it's really interesting program and it um you know we know that the construction industry as a whole suffers sometimes from having a poor image and that increasing the diversity of, of the industry itself could only help with that. So I think that it's a really useful program for members to take a look at. So as you say we'll be sending out information via email after the webinar as well. Um so thank you very much for that. I'm just handing over to Phil Hodge now who's our third and final speaker who's going to talk about the kickstart program. As you say, Brianne, we've had a mixture of positives and negatives with redundancy and fairness and inclusion and now we're going to talk about developing the skills in your business through the kickstart program. So it's a real mixture today and hopefully of interest to members. So over to you Phil. That's great. Thank you very much Hayley. So I'm going to do a quick whistle stop tour of the government kickstart scheme and explain on how it can be useful for your business uh in the construction industry. So just to give you a little bit of background, this is a program that was uh, launched by the government last year with the objective of creating quarter of a million new job placements for 16 to 24 year olds and the main attractor for employers is that the government will offer a grant of of 100% of the capped wage costs for all placements that are conducted through the kickstart scheme in addition to that employers receive another grant of 
£1,500 for each successful Kickstart applicant that goes through the programme. And the programme itself has a duration of six months. The uh, Kickstart scheme is, a, is applicable to a number of industry sectors, including, of course, the construction sector, which is why uh, we're highlighting this today. And uh, it's open for new applicants all the way through to the end of this year. The um, programme has eligibility criteria. Now, one thing that I just wanted to highlight was that originally when the programme was launched, it was restricted to companies that could offer at least 30 placements at a time. Now, the government has since relaxed that requirement, and it is open to micro and SME businesses now that can have as little as one potential vacancy for an applicant. So that makes it a lot more accessible for small businesses such as members of the Federation of Master Builders. Um, there is also no obligation for the employer to offer a full-time job to the applicant after the six-month period has elapsed. However, there is, of course, a benefit both to the employer and also to uh, the uh, the student in a way that the employer will know who that person is. They're a known quantity. They've worked in that business for six months. And also, as far as the employee is concerned, if they do then stay on in f um, full-time employment, they'll have access to free training and also skills development from the DWP. Now, one thing that's really important to take note of is that this is designed specifically for new posts within a business. So therefore, it's not there to replace redundant positions. And that's a, that's a really important factor to bear in mind. Uh, there's another expectation that the post will not require for the applicant to already have done extensive training. It's designed really as the first step for a young person to go into uh, a career path where they can have that first-hand experience of working in that particular domain. There is um, some flexibility in the program in as much as some applicants that may be aged over 25 years of age may have access to this resource, but it is essentially designed or determined on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, companies throughout England, Scotland and Wales can participate in this programme. So in terms of the funding structure, uh, the government will pay the national minimum, minimum wage according to the age group of the applicant, and it's geared at a rate of 25 hours per week. The government will also pay the NI contributions for that employee, and the employer receives the grant. Uh, sorry, the employee, the employee is paid through the employer's payroll system. The employer, however, will receive the grant money from the government on an arrears basis. So after the third month of the program, the employer receives half of the whole grant. And at the end of the six months, um, the government will pay the remaining amount. And during that six-month period, DWP and HMRC will, of course, check to make sure that the students are still participating in the programme. So just um, in terms of where things have gone so far since the programme was launched, 120,000 new jobs have been created through this scheme. Um, the employers uh, still have the opportunity if they want to go through is the gateway system, but essentially for small and SME type businesses, then those businesses can approach the government directly in order to participate. And as I say, the opportunities uh, are there for new applicants all the way through to the end of this year. So if you're interested in finding out more about this, you can go to the .gov website um, Alternatively, you can drop us uh, an email to our policy team or go to the fmb.org.uk um, website where if you put in the search terms kickstart, you'll find there's uh, pages of useful information and guidance on there. And I think that's probably my five minutes that's up. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Phil. That's great. Um, we have had a real mixture of different topics this afternoon, haven't we, with positives and negatives in terms of 
looking at redundancies, but also looking on at um, taking on new people through the Kickstart scheme. And I, for one, I'm, I'm pleased to hear about a government scheme that's been really successful, having been quite heavily involved with the Green Home Grant scheme, which we've also run a few webinars on recently, which was scrapped by the government last Saturday. So it's great to hear that that programme has gone on and created 120,000 new jobs in our industry. So um, if you've seen the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, I, I saw a couple of questions have been posted in there, which Anoop has already answered around the difference between voluntary and compulsory redundancy and use of um, different selection criteria when making multiple redundancies. There don't seem to be any further questions in there. So I think we'll probably just wrap up for this afternoon because we've got through all the presentations. And I just want to say thank you to our three speakers for today, for um, to Bryony for the fairness, inclusion and respect, to Brill, Phil for the uh, information about the Kickstart scheme, and of course to Anoop around the information on redundancy. And don't forget that any HR queries, you can call the FMB's advice line to speak to Anoop or one of her colleagues about HR issues. Thank you very much for attending. We're taking a little bit of a break now from webinars. We'll be back at the end of April and we're planning to bring you a webinar um, to help you spring clean your health and safety policies and procedures and make sure that you've got everything in place that you need health and safety wise. So uh, that's coming up at the end of April. And obviously you'll get information uh, on that from our communications team in due course. So thank you very much for attending this afternoon and see you at a future webinar and stay safe. Goodbye.